Right, the topic that we're talking about today is embracing collaboration with JRuby and JavaScript. Uh, my name is John Crosby, and during the day I work at Engine Yard. At night I work on quite a few open source projects, and many of which spawn the ideas for this talk today. And yeah, that's all I'll say. Uh, I also work on the Engine Yard cloud platform. We've got several of our engineers here today. Actually, half our company is probably here today. Uh, if you have any questions about that, obviously look me up. I'd love to talk about it. Incidentally, we are hiring. It looked like everyone was hiring when I saw the whiteboards out there, but we, we are also hiring. If you'd like to work on a team of really bright people who are a lot of fun to work with, please look me up or anyone on our team. Okay, so I thought that the focus of today's presentation would be a lot more on the mechanics of how bridging JavaScript and Ruby works. And uh, we're an agile shop at Engine Yard, so we like to create something, put it out there, let users test it, and then iterate on that. And so I've sort of been doing a, a mini version of this with this talk and people I work with and, and other friends that I can annoy occasionally. And usually the mechanics, once you've extracted them into a gem, which I'll show later, are fairly simple. But uh, most of my time is spent explaining why you'd ever want to do such a thing. And so I think that's probably the most value that I can provide for everyone here today is talking about the whys, how everything works together. And uh, I think that you'll see that the mechanics are pretty clear, but we can talk about some advice on how to use these things. And so in, in doing so, instead of just having a technical tutorial walkthrough, uh, I thought it'd be more fun to work at this from the viewpoint of a set of themes. The central principle driving all of this it, it turns out is the principle of dry. Do not repeat yourself. And I, I think it's really nice as a software engineer if you can find some sort of core principles that you're working with when you're developing that help drive all your decisions. It, take, it helps make um, things more clear when you're designing user interfaces or deciding how to go one way or another with code. And finding a central principle is actually a fairly popular topic. If you've been to some of Jim Weirich's presentations, you know he's searching for this grand unified theory of software development. And if you have a chance to hear him speak, definitely check that out. It's a, it's a really cool way to think about the software that you're building. But it goes beyond that even to music. Very odd, one of my uh, very favorite jazz guitarists, Pat Martino, he's been around for quite some time. He's an amazing improviser. He does jazz, bebop guitar. And I just happened to hear him out in the lobby earlier today. And uh, his, he's got an amazing life story if you have a moment to check it out. He, he was um, basically getting to the peak of his career back in the 60s and 70s. And he was playing this gig at this huge festival and then just totally just went silent. And so I think the other musicians he was playing with thought, this guy is like trying to have a big dramatic pause here or something. But what actually happened was he was suffering from a brain aneurysm while he was on stage. So uh, not too long after that, he had emergency surgery to save his life, forgot everything about who he was, how to eat, that he even played guitar, had to relearn absolutely everything. And now he's back at the peak of his game. But one of the things that makes him so awesome is that he has a central principle for everything he does with guitar improv that extends from a core concept of guitar geometry. And you don't have to buy a whole stack of books to learn how to play using his mindset. It's just a central principle that you can use to guide your entire exploration. So a little bit of a divergence, but really cool that you can extend from core principles in this way. Some other smaller themes that we're talking about here are pragmatism, not to be confused with short-sighted practicalism. We'll be talking a little bit about performance, uh, some surprising interactions some of these things have with the idea of craft or software craftsmanship. We're also talking about collaboration, obviously, and a, a much larger theme of just the web itself. So to kick it off, the first thing is the intersection of pragmatism in the, with the web or in the context of the web. And my uh, proposal for this talk jokingly started out saying, as web developers, we live in an arranged marriage with JavaScript. But I'm probably missing some cultural subtleties there. And I probably should have said something that would make a better analogy, which is you can consider it like siblings, right? We don't choose our brothers or sisters that we're born into families with, but we are living with them. And that's the way it feels a lot of times as Rubyists when we have to interact with JavaScript. And there are several strategies you can use when you're in this situation. The first one is the one that I've personally used for a very long time. Avoid it. Try not to write JavaScript. On consulting projects, <laughs> I, I can remember advocating very strongly for this for a long time. You know, we, we can't write JavaScript. It's different in every 
different browser, and this was in a Java gig at the time. And we need to be able to unit test everything we put out there. How can we be totally sure that this thing's the same in all these browsers and it always works unless we can unit test it? Things are different now. You can unit test JavaScript in the browser and at the command line, if you didn't know. But that was a good strategy at first, I think. Some of us then went to generating it, right? There's, there's a whole RGS thing we won't talk about today. But other strategies were even in Perl land. I worked with this guy named Matt Lenz back in St. Louis, where I come from. And uh, he was rolling his own Perl web framework like everyone was in those days. And we used something that would generate JavaScript. So we had a regular expression, of course, because it's Perl. And we were talking about the types of data on the server. And we could use that same regular expression in the browser to do some simple validations. It was kind of a, a nice abstraction there. And there's another area where you can do code generation like Dreamweaver. Again, won't cover that, but people used to use it to make tacky mouse overs with really tacky beveled buttons in browsers for navigations. <laughs> you remember what I'm talking about. Uh, another strategy that's a little bit more recent is using JavaScript as a compile target. Uh, I don't like this one because it's not very pragmatic. And so let's just have some fun talking about why. This is a beautiful JavaScript object. It's, ha it's a property foo that has the value of bar. And loading that object into a bit of JSON, or from a bit of JSON from URI, is exactly this simple if you're using something like jQuery on the client side. I like that. And that has some affinity with the way that we do things in Ruby. Contrasting that with the Google Web Toolkit, and we can have some fun with this because a lot of us don't write Java here. Uh, the Google Web Toolkit compiles Java down to JavaScript. And in their environment, it probably is pragmatic because they have a lot of Java developers. But the one thing I didn't really like about that is they're not using web protocols or what I, I like to consider the web protocols. They're using a, a mechanism known as RPC. And so again, it's not very webby. So we could throw that out. And I unfortunately did a very long-lived experiment integrating GWT in Rails using a plugin. And so to start that, I ripped out the GWT RPC stuff and started using GWT REST. And this is not what this whole thing is about today. Don't worry. Um, but the way it looks is instead of having this JavaScript object you can just throw up there, this is Java. So Java needs to know everything about what you might do with this object. And if it can be different in different scenarios, especially for schemaless things, then you need to define an interface. You need to say this thing's probably got an ID because we're storing in the browser. We need a way to populate it to and from JSON. And then maybe in general, they'll be sort of the same. So in Java, if you want to load some class you don't know about ahead of time, you can load it using this trick. Uh, doesn't work in GWT, or at least the version I was using at the time. So you do what every good Java developer does. You start making factories. And you have, like for example, this create interface that returns something that implements uh, this resource interface. And then it gets better. Instead of having this simple jQuery line that we saw, <laughs> We have a response callback. Of course, there's an abstract class above it. Of course, it implements an interface that GWT is expecting. <laughs> and then, yeah, you get this thing back on your response received hook. You use the factory to create it, implements this thing. And then you populate it with your JSON text that you got, and then call back into the framework. Ouch, that's a lot of code. But we're not done yet. <laughs> yeah, well, wait, there's more. So on the Rails end of the spectrum, since we can do cool things with Ruby, we can inspect the MySQL data store. We know all the properties that are available. So we can use that to uh, code generate, unfortunately, this class that extends FooBase, which we'll make fun of in a second. But if you have something that a Java guy would call business logic, that would go in this class. You could change it all the time. It's not very brittle, because it's not going to get overwritten with subsequent generation. That is not very dry, because it's going to end up being duplicated on both sides of the fence. So more fun here, this base object that we extend, this is the thing that actually implements resource, and it has to know about every property in the active record data model. So that's where this string foo is coming from. And we, again, we populate it. And those three dots there, it's just lines and lines of pain all the way down. <laughs> so I am making the case today that that is not a very pragmatic way to integrate JavaScript with your code. And it's not very webby. As a slightly different take that I won't spend time making fun of, because it's actually kind of cool, is the guys doing Cappuccino. They have Objective-J in the browser. It's a little bit more like Objective-C. It's a superset of JavaScript, so you actually don't have to bridge if you don't want to. You can just write JavaScript directly. Worth checking out if you're interested. Uh, this last one is definitely not pragmatic, but I think it's a more forward-looking way of thinking about this. In Rubenius, if you're familiar with this, it's a Ruby implementation built on LLVM, the low low-level virtual machine. And what 
LLVM is, is a compiler toolkit. There's just a series of phases things go to to get to machine code on the other end. So it's language front end like Ruby, C, C++, Objective-C. Apple's using it to do some pretty cool things these days. They eventually end up at this intermediate representation. It looks like high level assembly language. It has functions. It doesn't quite look as gross as assembly. And then finally there's a back end that turns it into machine code. So in Rubinius, you've got Ruby source, actually goes to bytecode, eventually ends up at LLVM intermediate representation, and then generates machine code. So there's the summary. The cool part is that these backends are pluggable in LLVM. So it's, it's feasible to use Ruby to generate this IR and then write a JavaScript backend for LLVM. So what that would actually allow you to do is run Ruby code in the browser with no plugins, which I think is compelling because I, I think that we've been saying as a development community over and over again, we don't really want your plugins in our browser, and we'd like an open way to do these things. That's one way you could do it. And because this IR is totally language agnostic, every language compiles directly to this, you could do things like Python into this intermediate representation that then compiles to JavaScript. Haskell, you can, you can get as crazy as you want. And then, what? Yeah, you can think of it as decompile. Yeah, that's probably a better, a better way to look at it. Uh, but if you see the reputation of this uh, JavaScript going on here, you could imagine a model where, as the browser vendors, if they would adopt something like this low-level virtual machine code, we could all write whatever languages we wanted to and run those in the browser. So that's not very pragmatic, as we said. What about today? So getting in the meat of this, embracing JavaScript, I think, is the best way to deal with it um, at this time. And this allows us to embrace collaboration in various aspects. The first one we'll talk about is collaboration in the human context. So I took these numbers from GitHub. If you look at their code that's hosted there, 25% of the code on GitHub is Ruby. That already is very cool. That's a huge community. Lots of us are already here. I've seen a lot of faces that I've only seen avatars for here today. And it's, we have a cool community. So already, that's a big win. But if you look at the percentage of JavaScript code on GitHub, that's actually pretty large compared to all the other languages, 17%. So again, that's a big community of people that we could be working with. But the Steve Jobs boom moment <laughs> that we get to here is that if you look at languages that have an affinity for the web, Python, Perl, PHP, Java, things like that, it's uh, nearly 70% of the code on GitHub is in a language where people are typically dealing with JavaScript in some manner. So that is a massive community that we have the potential to collaborate with by sharing libraries across our language boundaries. Now we can extend this principle into machine-based collaboration as well. And this all funnels out of the dry principle. This was my prompt personally to implement a framework called CloudKit. You can find on GitHub, and I'm going to use CloudKit as sort of a storytelling mechanism here so that I don't bore you. The idea is to mount these RESTful collections without um, too much tedious, repetitious work. So if I'm building a Rails application, for example, um, I would typically generate a controller if I want to have some collection called things that I'm managing, right? And I generate a model, I generate a migration, questionable set of tests depending on what test framework you're using and how, how they like to do things. Uh, you generate a helper and a set of views to do all of your CRUD operations. And then if you're doing heavy JavaScript validation or, or I shouldn't say validation, work in the browser, user interaction, then you end up writing or generating JavaScript models that match these and controllers as well in the browser. Contrast that with CloudKit, which abstracts all these principles. Um, I was able to reduce it to one line of configuration in a rackup file. So now you can say expose things. And now you automatically get these things that would require code generation and duplication in Rails. So you can get a collection of things out of the, the web service. You can get a specific thing, this thing with the ID 123, all the historical versions of these things. Um, even specific versions based on the e-tag, ABC for that one, in, in a previous point in time. You can post to create new things inside the collection. You can do a put to update a specific thing. You can also delete things, of course, and then get and head are interchangeable if you just want to get the metadata about an object. There's even more, but we're going to wait a second. So now we've got one line of code, and we're still writing and generating JavaScript models and controllers. So again, there's still some things that aren't really dry there. So let's see if we can take those out, dry this up a little bit more. And we can do this using machine-based collaboration. So the principle here is that there's a root 
URL that anything working with this service can bootstrap from. And you can ask it to return things like what collections are hosted on your web service. Now from this point, I, I have an in to everything else hosted on this service. And so in addition to the things that we just talked about, you can use the HTTP verb options, which surprisingly, um, it, it isn't used a lot, and I think it might even cause a 500 and older versions of Rails. But you can, you can ask for the options that you can perform with this thing's collection, or what you can do with all these specific things. And what, according to the spec, should happen and, and does in CloudKit is that you get an allow header back saying, these are the operations you can perform on this object or this collection of objects. And so I use that uh, to create a plugin for CloudKit called jQuery CloudKit. And that enabled me to do things like set up a store. It's just this jQuery plugin. You boot it. That's just like your on ready function in jQuery when you start something up. Once it boots, it's actually synchronized all your data with the server. So all your collections are local. They're, they're a mirror of what's in your user data on the server. And you can do things like create objects. And it's all asynchronous because you are working with user interactions. And then you can use it just like you might expect. So this is sort of an intersection of themes here on our path to JRuby and Rhino. Uh, this is machine-based collaboration uh, following this drive principle, um, leveraging human collaboration in a language like JavaScript that's running on arguably the collaborative platform, which is the web. But before we get too excited about how we're following these cool principles and doing cool things, we should note that we've totally overlooked querying, which is also very common. We need to be able to ask questions like all things that have a foo property that's equal to bar. So how would you typically do this? You would write an active record thing, or you would use some sort of custom finder. You'd extract those parameters in a controller. You, you might ask questions like, does this apply to all my controllers? Because maybe it's pagination. I want the second set of 10 in this whole data set. And then you need to make sure that the view sends all the correct parameters and all the different views that you're using. But if you think about how this is playing out, you've got data already loaded once you've interacted with the service a little bit in the browser being on the server. So what about a situation where there's a poor network connectivity or you're on the train, which is where I do a lot of my personal hacking? Uh, do, you, do you limit your users from searching when they're not connected to the internet? Because they already have the data there. So why should they have to be online to ask your server to search the data that's already local and then return it back to them again, right? That's not very dry, so let's clean this up. Other problems. It's different for every single web app. It's a one-off snowflake sort of situation. It's not using machine-based collaboration. It's certainly not collaborative with other people because it's not uh, shared or standard. So JSON query uh, from this guy named Chris Zip in Dojo land. Uh, this sort of standard lets you ask things in a cross-service manner. So I can say, these things, give me all of them that have foo that equals bar or rating greater than this. or this little double period here is recursive descent. So any nested object that has rating that's not equal to 3, sort it ascending by the rating and give me items 10 through 19. You can do this in the browser or on the server. So then your question is, now do I write two versions of this, one in the browser, one on the server? That's also not very dry. So now we have this sort of this pragmatism here. Like We don't want to duplicate our work. We want to keep it dry. We want to use these types of collaboration. And that's what finally prompted using a bridge. So this isn't an, an impractical, wild, crazy experiment as much as this was actually needed. And that's where this came from. So running JavaScript on the server side now, there's several choices that you can make. One is Node.js. Node is really cool if you haven't checked it out. Um, I was pretty excited about it the first time I saw it and uh, started using it from day one, writing a lot of code in it. It's pretty fast. if you write it what would look like a rack app in Node. It's using Google's V8 engine, and it's using all non-blocking I.O. So I was able to get like 3,700 requests per second on my laptop in JavaScript, which is unheard of previously. It's good stuff. Check it out. The thing I didn't like about it is that if there's anything that Node doesn't provide as a wrapper to V8, that means I'm in C++ land, which I don't want to be in. And so I had to toss that one aside, uh, being pragmatic. There's also SpiderMonkey. That's the C-based JavaScript engine that's used in Firefox. Uh, a lot of projects do use that. CouchDB, Vendor, SpiderMonkey. I think MongoDB has made the switch from Rhino to using uh, SpiderMonkey as well. And there's a Ruby project called Johnson that's a Ruby to JavaScript bridge that also uses that. I ran into the same problem there as well. Um, it's a good project, really good people hacking on it. I know that it's, it's getting there. Maybe it is already there now. But I was, I was pushing part of it that was causing some seg faults. 
and I couldn't get in and troubleshoot that because I'm, I'm not really a C person by trade. There's also WebKit, and I think Chris Wanstroth wrote a bridge um, to use this with MacRuby. But again, that, I, ca I couldn't use that because I was thinking about ways I might want to deploy this. So thinking about JVM performance and stability in production, plus this idea of just being pragmatic, finding a way I could do this today, is what led me to JRuby and Rhino. It actually happened during a, a hack day at Engine Yard, and I, I was just frustrated. I just thought, OK, I'm going to try this out. I'm going to write some stuff. I'm going to show that it seg faults, and then I'm going to try to try this in uh, JRuby and Rhino and, and show that it doesn't seg fault. That was my hack fest demo. Watch this not seg fault. But it worked. <laughs> <laughs> So JRuby, as you know, Ruby on the Java virtual machine. Rhino, less people know about, but that's a, a Java library that you can access. Um, it's also from Mozilla. And you can use that to use Java to script JavaScript. So techniques for crossing from JRuby to Java, it's actually pretty nice. The JRuby guys have done great work on integrating this. Um, so if you're looking to do something like this, this is sort of the approach that you can take. There's the Java code I found on the Mozilla website that's showing how to use Rhino from Java. So you've got some import statements. You're setting up a context, which you can think of as your, your JavaScript session. And then finally, you have this scriptable scope thing that you can call commands on. That's like uh, manipulating your session, basically. To convert this to Ruby, it's pretty simple. You keep the import statements there in JRuby. You obviously don't need the semicolons. You can take off the typing information here in the the third line, we don't need to declare types in Ruby. You don't need the semicolon and parentheses. Done with that line. We can do the same trick with the next line. It's now a little bit more concise. It's not quite idiomatic because of the camel case method calls in Java. Java. But uh, the JRuby guys have also done some work there so that you can use uh, what you might call snake case to make this integration very smooth. So now we've got something that we can command from Ruby, and it's actually talking through Java to JavaScript via Rhino. So after working with this, seeing ways that I could use it, I decided to abstract it into a gem uh, that's been published. It's called Snarl. It's on my GitHub account. It's also on Gem Cutter. Uh, the slogan I got from Ben Burkert at work, JavaScript in disguise. It was taken from the cover of this JavaScript book, but I couldn't use Rhino because the Mozilla guys already stole that. So I picked the closest thing I could think to to that, and this is this transformer. I had a variation of this toy as a kid uh, until one of my, my neighbors stole it. I was really ticked off. <laughs> but this guy's name was, was Snarl. So, <laughs> so this context that you create in, in Ruby uh, is called Snarl JavaScript Context. You just create a new one of those. And from here on out, you can just play with it like it was a browser session. So context, evaluate, 1 plus 1 in JavaScript. That returns true on, in Ruby land. There's also. Um, you can do things like, in JavaScript, you can assign functions to variables. So here's a simple function to increment whatever number you pass in. And then because you're doing this in the same context, later on you can make another call to say, increment this number I just passed in. And there it is. It comes out to four. That's not super scientific or, or elite. Uh, you can also think of this context as your, your global scope. So if you want to set a variable, put foo, set the value equal to bar. And then if you want to get it back out later, you're also just saying get foo and returning bar. Uh, where this starts to lend a little bit more power to you while you're writing code and wanting to share code with other people is the fact that you can load a whole JavaScript library just by calling this load function. And we'll get back to some cool things we can do with this in a second. Keep in mind, though, that if you are using something like this, that crossing the bridge is definitely not free. Uh, so keep all of your interactions with it coarse grain. For example, if I'm going to evaluate some JavaScript here and iterate over a collection of 10,000 items and just keep in incrementing those and storing them in a total, really trivial stuff shouldn't take long, right? It's not bad. It's 0.04 seconds, and that's using uh, the bridge in a coarse grain manner. Now, if we want to do the same thing using Ruby and in the middle of this tight loop, context eval this JavaScript, I actually was pretty sad about <laughs> how poorly this performed. And I thought, maybe it's a string interpolation here. So I took that out and just hard-coded some number in there. Made almost no difference at all. 6.98 seconds. Just to in <laughs> iterate over this measly little 10,000 objects here. So don't take that approach when you're building your library. And I thought in building this, I would be creating Ruby objects that live in JavaScript and vice versa and trying to proxy them back and forth. 
it just wasn't a pragmatic way to go. I've not included any of that stuff in my library because it's, it's not very useful at this point. Maybe someday it will be pragmatic. However, if performance is not a concern and you would just like to, say, provide a scripting API for users to use in a one-off manner, then there is a project uh, by this guy named Cowboy D on GitHub called the Ruby Rhino. And after blogging and, and sort of talking about this a little bit, um, he sent me a message on GitHub, very cool feature, <laughs> and we decided to collaborate. So I think eventually we're going to mix our projects in the same thing, but he's taken a more fine-grained approach. So if you're interested in that sort of scripting or seeing the techniques that he used, that's a cool project to check out. And I don't know whether he'll host my code or I'll host his, but it doesn't really matter as long as we're, we're collaborating. So back to this JSON query idea we talked about earlier, uh, this, this guy, Chris Zip, who wrote the JavaScript library in jo Dojo to implement JSON query, he's provided that in a dependency-free manner for other people to use in uh, other areas of JavaScript development. So in CloudKit, what I end up doing is keeping the whole framework, but then right at the end, using this JSON query library. So the way it works is it just attaches to a root uh, DOM element here, and you can say, pass in whatever query came across the wire, and then give it the collection that it's searching. That seemed cool as a pragmatic step forward, but it's really scary <laughs> from a performance aspect because this JSON thing means all of your data. So how are you getting all this data, <laughs> especially if you're storing it in Ruby land? Uh, that, it just doesn't seem very feasible to pass your entire database as an, a, an argument to <laughs> a function. <laughs> so we'll get back to how we solve this problem in a minute. But we're going to take a diversion here. Validation. Normally, if you're going to validate some objects, what do you do? You're using the active record in Ruby on the server, and you're duplicating those same validations in the browser with JavaScript. And that is sort of a pain. It's also it's not very dry. So again, let's use this uh, to help us out. It's also, if you're duplicating things here, you're not letting the machines collaborate with themselves to solve the problem for you. You're going through this exercise that requires a human. Fill in values, submit it and then see if it worked. But there's no way for me to tell ahead of time if my thing's going to fail. I just have to try it and see if it breaks. And that's not very good interaction design. So this uh, JSON schema is another thing also by Chris Zip. He's quite the thinker, and he's quite prolific with standard proposals. Ah, how about that? Oh, yeah. There you go. Cool. Sorry about that. Sounded quiet to me suddenly. Okay, so JSON schema. This is uh, me declaring that I have a person that's an object, because uh, the other top level thing you can do in, in JSON is just have an array as the outer thing. It has these properties the person's name is a string. Uh, we've got some things about the birth date, some mins and max. We can use an integer if you want to use like Unix time or maybe a string, but the format we're expecting is date time, and it's also optional. If you don't want to tell me how old you are, I'm not going to push it. So the cool thing about JSON schema is that you can use it in combination with something called um, LARD or low-level resource descriptor. Uh, also, uh, there, there's sort of uh, an intersection there with another spec called uh, HTTP link headers. So just like in, in HTML, you'd say a href rel something or other. You can do this in header land, too, for machine interactions. So we're saying that this thing that we just grabbed, this thing number 123, this um, hypertext reference here with the semicolon schema on the end of it, the relationship is described by, and we're using JSON schema to describe this. So this lets me detect what I d expect on the server side to be the validation. And even cooler, and there, I think they've done some experiments with this in Dojo land, you can use that to generate user interface elements. Like if I know that there's a string here, I can generate some things just to start with and start iterating on the user interface. It's a pretty cool technique. And then obviously we return this foobar thing. So again, there's another library out there called JSON schema. All these things, by the way, you can find on my GitHub account. I've usually taken the libraries. If they're not on Git, I put them in um, GitHub. and then write a test suite around them. Most of them aren't tested, so I've written unit tests to first learn about the library and then allow me to start 
um, refactoring or trying to mold it into the situation I'm in. So using it, we can say validate. Here's name, Carl Huda, and I pass in the schema that we created earlier. This is just going to say, yes, this is valid. And then we can try to mess it up, pass in a number for the name, and we get this thing back saying, no, it's not valid. And then we have error messages. Number, number found, but a string is required. And here, the path to the thing that was busted is using something called JSON path, which is kind of like XPath, but for JSON. Is that directly aligned to attribution validation stuff, or is it just similar? Um, I don't know if they invented it with that in mind or not. Yeah, I'm not sure. So this, again, this is using machine collaboration to keep things dry. And the unintended consequence that came out of this was actually a, a performance benefit. And that is that this big entire database that we passed in as a method argument in JavaScript land, we can actually index that for querying performance using JSON schema. So thinking of JavaScript and JSON being sort of like Ruby, they're schema free, you can kind of do whatever you want with them. There's a lot of things you don't really care about and you're not going to be searching on. But there are property, certain properties that you might care about, like for a user, you, you might care about their name. So by declaring that using JSON schema, you're saying, this is something that exists for everything in my collection, and this is something that's, that might be important. So you can use this information to control how you index the data. I think this is maybe a little bit more usable approach than, say, MapReduce, which will cover you in all situations. It's not saying that you should do one or the other. I think maybe in conjunction, this will be something cool to see in CouchDB <coughs> someday, where you could just overlay this schema on a collection to say they sort of look like this, and then you can um, spin off workers on the back end to try to keep this, uh, the indexes updated, and you can index things on the way in. So that raises the next question. Where do the indexes live? If you keep the indexes on the Ruby side, if you imagine a request coming into your server, you have to think about the data that's coming in. You can't just slap it in the database. You have to look around in it and update some indexes, but then on the JavaScript side, you don't know about those, so you end up crossing the bridge again in this really fine-grained manner, and, and we saw the performance of that just completely stinks. So the idea is, Lots of bridge crossing is bad. Let's try not to do this. So this spawned a, yet another project, extracting everything in CloudKit that was at the database layer on down into its own JavaScript library. And it sort of models itself af after Data Mapper. Um, I haven't actually open sourced this piece yet, but maybe by the end of the conference, I'll get enough hacking to do so. Uh, I was previously using Node.js, as I mentioned earlier, and I'm in the middle of ripping out some of the assumptions I had in there for that. Uh, so again, modeling itself after data mapper or active record, you're doing all your create reads, updates, and deletes in JavaScript. All your callbacks are also in JavaScript, so you can attach before saves, after creates, things like that. And your indexing also lives inside the database in JavaScript. And the cool part about it is in the data mapper model, you have this concept of adapters. So you're not always using data mapper against a SQL store, for example, sometimes. I saw you hit a live code one time, a, a Gmail adapter for Data Mapper, which was pretty cool to see it in a lightning talk. But uh, he was persisting data to Gmail over IMAP. So in, in my case, in this thing, was uh, to adapt inside the JavaScript database. I have two adapters right now. One is an in-memory adapter where you'd expect to find JavaScript objects in the browser. Uh, the other piece is um, a local storage adapter, also fully functional, so if you go offline, uh, Safari, Firefox, IE all ex um, support this idea of local storage. So you come back online later. It's, it's basically like a long-lived session that's tied exactly to a, a single domain name. Uh, the cool part about that is beyond that, you can run this exact same database on the server side. So for example, in my Ruby project using this bridge, I can run the same database, have a different adapter that's, because it's in Java or JRuby, I can actually adapt that to the file system. So now we have the same indexing strategy, the same validation strategy, and the same storage strategy on both sides of the browser and the server. This completely dries up pretty much everything left that I've been complaining about here. So then you might ask, what's left? Well, not a whole lot, but this is, again, this is sort of targeted towards a heavy JavaScript interaction type of app. So the routing, it's still in rack, the benef and also middleware, so authentication, uh, in CloudKit, for example, instead of saying expose these resources, you can say contain them, and it automatically puts OpenID or OAuth in front of those collections. Well, 
we can keep that stuff in Ruby and, and still work in that world, but it also allows us to continue to in integrate with existing Ruby apps. So if you have a Sinatra app that's rack-based or, or Rails or Merb, that stuff can continue to work and you can continue to share code there. Uh, if you want to take it one step further, just trying to go all the way off the deep end at this point, uh, you can try to reduce context switching even further by saying, yes, I'll keep my routing in Rack. However, Rack's interfaces that they're just calling lambdas to return functions back to the browser, basically. You could mount JavaScript middleware in Rack using Snarl. So Rack does your routing, gets, gets the point where it's saying, here's the request that came in. You can hand this off using Snarl and mount that and write all of your code in JavaScript there. Uh, taking it one step further than this, is something called JSGI. So if, if you've heard of WSGI is the Python standard for this web server gateway interface. That was what spawned Rack, this, the Ruby parallel to that. They also have one called Jack in JavaScript, and it's sort of this uh, JSGI standard. So to wrap up here, the, the surprising other theme that I ran across was this idea of crap. This came, came up over some really good Mexican food with a coworker. Uh, named Gilberto Medrano is here. If you have a chance to talk to him, uh, he works with us at Engine Yard on user interaction design. He's, he's very bright, and I, I've been able to learn a lot from working with him. But the idea is that if you really care about the application that you're building, and you're working, um, let's say, on something that has lots of interactions that need to work very well, uh, hopefully all of your apps are like this, but I've seen some places where that matters less. Uh, you can do away with terms and actually try to consider them to be obscene, like front-end developer. That's our front-end guy that's going to do that. Or he's the CSS guy. And you can do away with other terms, like that's the back-end guy's job, or I'll have my DBA write these SQL scripts for me. I hear less of this in the Ruby community, but it is really prolific in the Java community. Um, so the idea there is that everyone working on your development team takes full ownership of what they're building, and it's more like the craftsman model. You care about everything that you're building, every interaction with the user, and because the context that you're working in is very close to the user experience, because you're using something like JavaScript, then your mind is also naturally connected with the user and how these things work. So I think it's, it's a compelling way to promote collaboration, um, even outside of our developer communities, just with the users that we're building our applications for. So what we've covered here is basically the pragmatic ways to use JavaScript in the near term with JRuby and Rhino and also talked about some crazy far-fetched ideas of using LLVM and running Ruby in the browser. And all this has been driven from this core engineering principle of do not repeat yourself. That is it. Um, if we aren't able to answer some questions in here, this, this is all my contact information, my personal site, Twitter, my GitHub account. I'd love to work with you guys on projects if you're using things like this. Uh, but for now, we looks like we've got about seven minutes left. So if there's any questions, I'd love to answer them. Yes. Yeah. Are you using any of these on the production apps? Or are you using this on any production apps? Uh, no. None of these are being used on production apps. Um, obviously, JRuby is in production in a lot of places. But these things I've been working on have been more experimental. And I've been hesitant to ever slap a 1.0 on CloudKit, for example, because of all this flux in the background and trying out these different models. But uh, my personal intent is to use this in a production environment for some apps I'm writing in JavaScript. They're uh, not not for work at this at this point. Yeah. yeah. Um, the JSON schema stuff you're talking about, you, you're envisioning that as more of like a, I mean, client side validation uh, specifically with that. Uh, you were thinking like not as a substitute for server side, but as a just a, an analog. So. It would do that first, and then it would go to the server, which would do it again to make sure that everything was right. Yeah, so if, if you're using JSON schema, you actually would have the same set of code running on both sides of the fence. And yeah, just in case someone had disabled those protection mechanisms and submitted requests, you'd have the same thing running on the server side. There, I would imagine that for the really simple cases, those will be the same, but that there are some times when you don't want to expose some of that information in the browser. So you would, you would probably have to supplement that on the server side somewhat. I saw some other hands. You, yeah, when we're yeah. talking about uh, offline databases, uh, yeah. whether it's offline or, or online, it doesn't really seem to matter. Yeah. And uh, it strikes me that 
obviously you want one client to only download the portion of the database that's relevant to them. Yes. And when you're running on the server side, do you execute against just portions of the database that's relevant to, that's relevant to that client, mm -hmm. or do you run against the whole database and do extra stuff to limit uh, the way you would in your regular uh, Rails project to say, you know, clients dot uh, invoices. Right. So the question here is basically the scope of the, the data that you're querying. Is it everyone's stuff siloed or is it all shared and, and how do you secure that? Um, I've stepped around part of that in CloudKit. When, when you say expose, it's just all open data. Anyone can do anything with what's created. When you say contain, it's you're only working with your own thing. So when you put it up there, you're the only one that can do anything and access it. The next layer that I've started designing with this adapter layer that I was talking about in the JavaScript engine is using a form of ACL. So put this ACL, which I'm trying to come up with a way to represent that in JSON that would be fairly generic, but put this ACL on this collection that I've created, and the users are all indicated by their open IDs. So we could even grant permissions to people on other websites or other services. So right now, I haven't totally tackled all that. I think that there's going to be some, some more optimizations we'll have to drill out by making that. What about the implementation of the databases? Um, I mean, is it, is it SQLite on, on the ah. clients? Is it SQLite on the server? What is it? Yeah, so implementation-wise for databases, if you're using local storage in the browser, there's just some native code that you're actually getting access to there. There's also, like in Safari, there's a local SQLite database that you can access. I started using that, but it was actually more complex than what I needed, um, which is in the local storage, which is more hatch um, key value based. But on the server side, that's, that won't scale really. So the old CloudKit model was using Tokyo Cabinet, which is ridiculously fast, very stable. Um, it's a C library with really good Ruby bindings. So several projects are working on that. Uh, but to make this work with the, the new JavaScript approach, what I ended up doing was creating an, an append-only array that I'm using for storage. So every time you update something, it just goes on the end. And that would, uh, it obviously it works in the browser. It's, it's not a big deal. But on the server side, then you're just appending to the same file. And you can avoid some corruption. I totally stole that idea from CouchDB. But I think that's a, it's a good model for doing writes safely. And then you can process that. Uh, exactly, yeah. Yes? Does JSONDB get its email information from the database in itself? Um, as in? As in, like, it queries the database, what's your schema? Or yeah, um, it, JSONDB doesn't really care about the schema unless you tell it to. So the thing I'm working on right now is how, how you apply the schema to a collection. And I don't have all that worked out yet, like how it's going to spin off workers for things you haven't cared about previously, but now you care about their structure. So I, I don't have all the answers there. But the idea is that once you declare the schema for a particular collection, um, that's how it knows what it is. But it doesn't care about anything else. It's just all JSON data. So as a user of it in JavaScript, if you want to access a property that hasn't been declared, it's fine. You can set properties you, don't, you haven't declared before. No big deal. Just as long as you're not stepping on something that you've declared to be a certain format. So yeah. you do have to declare it once to actually set up your database, and then again you need JSON. Um, well, you can actually set up your database as totally schema-free. Yeah. But yeah, then otherwise when you're booting it, you'd have to say, here's my config. Yeah. Good question. Yes? Uh, not particularly active record to JSON schema, but the ThoughtBot guys, how I originally found out about them is they were working on this library called Jester, which was an active resource client in JavaScript, yeah, to use Rails in the back end. I don't know where the project is at this point, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think Tamer's here. He might be able to answer, answer a little bit of that. Any other questions? Yes. Just thought I'm going to give an um, update on Johnson tonight. At oh, awesome. The, the, uh, the okay. Are yeah, for everyone's benefit, there's an update on Johnson coming at the Lightning Talks tonight, so I'd, I'd be very interested to check out what's going on there. Thanks. Awesome. No, I'm not. Are they presenting at the Lightning Talks by any chance? Or? Oh, awesome. And what's the names of those libraries again? Uh, Ruby JS and Ray and Adonis. Okay. I wouldn't say either of them are private matters, but they're interesting. All right. Red and? Ruby 
RubyJS, two other JavaScript Rhino bridges that are available. Oh, Ruby to JavaScript. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, we should wrap up. I see other people coming in. I'm right at 45 minutes, so thanks a lot.